Hi everybody, welcome to chapter 18. Uh, so the last chapter, Atreyu and Bastion were in Silver City and Bastion told two stories that both came true by the power of his wishes. The first one was he gave the, uh, the city of Amarganth a library that's full of all of his stories. And the second story, he sent Hero Heinrich on this impossibly deadly quest to fight like this larger than life, weird monster dragon thing called Smurg. And if you remember uh, the picture of it and how Bastion described it, it's a pretty strange creature. I haven't come across in like any book, anything remotely like this. <laughs> so there it is again. That might be a fun creative writing, creative drawing thing that you might want to take up in your spare time. Try and come up with a monster weirder than Smurg. Uh, anyway, so after that, they left Silver City. Atreyu says, I'm going to help you get back home, Bastion, to your world. And Bastion's like, oh, okay, if you, know, if, if you want, because he's enjoying his time in Fantasia. He doesn't see any reason to go home yet. Um, and we're also seeing that little by little, Bastion's been forgetting bits and pieces of his life before Fantasia, his life in our world. And Atreyu's starting to put it together, starting to put together what's going on. He doesn't know for sure yet that he's sharp and he's asking questions like, you don't remember, you used to be like fat and pale and look different than you are now. And Ashen's like, nope, I've, I've always been like this. What are you talking about, Atreyu? Shh, just, I don't know, you're crazy. Uh, so we're gonna learn more about that. Uh, but for now, they're just leaving Silver City. They're starting on their quest. Uh, with Bastion's new mule, his new talking mule, Yika, and uh, the three knights that went with them, uh, Hickory and the Strong, Hisbald the Swift, and Hydorn the Enduring. So here's chapter 18, The Acarus. Okay. Rain was coming down in buckets. The black, wet clouds hung so low they seemed almost to graze the heads of the riders. Then big sticky snowflakes began to fall, and in the end it was snowing and raining in one. The wind was so strong that even the horses had to brace themselves against it. The riders' cloaks were soaked through and flapped heavily against the backs of the beasts. For the last three days they had been riding over a desolate high plateau. The weather had been getting steadily worse, and the ground was a mixture of mud and sharp stones that made for hard going. Here and there, the monotony of the landscape was broken by clumps of bushes or of stunted, wind-bowed trees. Bastion, who rode in the lead on his mule Yika, was fairly well off with his glittering silver mantle, which, though light and thin, proved to be remarkably warm and shed water like a duck. The low-slung body of Hickrian the Strong almost vanished in his thick blue woolen coat. The delicately built Hisbald had pulled his great laden hood over his red hair, and Hydorn's gray canvas cloak clung to his gaunt frame. Yet, in their rather crude way, the three knights were of good cheer. They hadn't expected their adventure with Sir Bastion to be a Sunday stroll. Now and then, with more spirit than art, they sang into the storm, sometimes singly and sometimes in chorus. Their favorite song seemed to be one that began with the words, When that I was a little tiny boy, with hey-ho the wind and the rain. As they explained, this had been sung by a human who had visited Fantasia long years before, name of Shakespeare or something of the sort. The only one in the group who didn't seem to mind the cold and the rain was Atreyu. On Falcor's back, he rode high above the clouds, flying far ahead to, re to reconnoiter and rejoining the company from time to time to report on what he had seen. They all, they all, even the Luck Dragon, believed they were looking for the road that would take Bastion back to his world. Bastion thought so too. He himself didn't realize that he had agreed to Atreyu's suggestion only to oblige his friend, and that wasn't what he really wanted. But the geography of Fantasia is determined by wishes, which may or may not be conscious. And since it was Bastion who led the way, they were actually going deeper and deeper into Fantasia heading for the ivory tower at its very center. What the consequences for him would be, he wouldn't learn until much later. For the present, neither he nor his companions had any idea where they were going. Bastion's thoughts were busy with a different problem. On the second day of their journey in the forest surrounding the Lake of Tears, he had seen unmistakable traces of the dragon's smurg. Some of the trees had been turned to stone, 
no doubt by contact with the monster's ice-cold fire, and the prints of the giant grasshopper feet were clearly discernible. Atreyu, who was skilled in woodcraft, had seen other tracks as well, those of Hero Heinrich's horse, which meant that Heinrich was close on the dragon's heels. That doesn't really thrill me, said Falcor, rolling his ruby red eyes. Monster or not, this smurg is a relative of mine. A distant one, to be sure, but a relative all the same. He was only half in jest. They had not followed Hero Heinrich's track, but had taken a different direction, since their supposed aim was to find Bastion's way home. And now Bastion was asking himself, had it really been such a good idea to invent a dragon for Hero Heinrich? True, Heinrich had needed a chance to show his mettle, but was it certain that he would win? What if Smurg killed him? And what about Princess Oglemar? Yes, of course she had been haughty, but, that, but was that a reason for getting her into such a fix? And on top of all that, how was he to know what further damage Smurg might do in Fantasia? Without stopping to think, Bastion had created an unpredictable menace. It would be there long after he was gone and quite possibly kill or maim any number of innocents. As he knew, Moonchild drew no distinction between good and evil, beautiful and ugly. To her mind, all the creatures in Fantasia were equally important and worthy of consideration. But had he, Bastion, the right to take the same attitude? And above all, did he wish to? No, Bastion said to himself, he had no wish to go down in the history of Fantasia as a creator of monsters and horrors. How much finer it would be to become famous for his unselfish goodness, to be a shining model for all, to be revered as the good human or the great benefactor. Yes, that was what he wanted. The country became mountainous, and Atreyu, return, returning from a reconnaissance flight, reported that a few miles ahead, he had sighted a glen which seemed to offer shelter from the wind. In fact, if his eyes had not deceived him, there were several caves round about that they could take refuge from the rain and snow. It was already late afternoon, high time to find suitable quarters for the night. So all the others were delighted at Atreyu's news and spurred their mounts on. They were making their way through a valley, possibly a dried-out riverbed enclosed in mountains, which grew higher as the travelers advanced. Some two hours later, they reached the glen, and true enough, there were several caves in the surrounding cliffs. They chose the largest and made themselves as comfortable as they could. The three knights gathered brushwood and branches that had been blown down by the storm, and soon they had a splendid fire going in the cave. The wet cloaks were spread out to dry, the beasts were brought in and unsaddled, and even Falcor, who ordinarily preferred to spend the night in the open, curled up at the back of the cave. All in all, it wasn't such a bad place to be in. While Hydorn the Enduring tried to roast a big chunk of meat over the fire, and the others watched him eagerly, Atreyu turned to Bastion and said, Tell us some more about Krista. About what? Bastion asked. Your friend, Krista, the little girl you told your stories to. I don't know any little girl by that name, said Bastion. And what makes you think I told her stories? Once again, Atreyu had that thoughtful look. Back in your world, he said slowly, you used to tell lots of stories, some to her and some to yourself. How do you know that, Atreyu? You said so yourself in Amarganth, and you also said that people made fun of you for it. Bastion stared into the fire. That's true, he muttered. I did say that, but I don't know why. I can't remember. It all seemed very strange. Atreyu exchanged glances with Falcor and nodded gravely, as though something one of them had said had now been proved true. But he said nothing more. Evidently, he didn't wish to discuss matters in front discuss such matters in front of the three knights. The meat's done, Hydorn announced. He cut off a chunk for each one and they all began to eat. Done was a gross exaggeration. The meat was charred on the outside and raw on the inside but under the circumstances, there was no point in being picky and choosy. For a while, they were all busy chewing. Then Atreus said to Bastion, Tell us how you came to Fantasia. You know all about that, said Bastion. It was you who brought me to the childlike empress. I mean, before that, said Atreyu, in your world. Where did you live, and how did it all happen? Then Bastion told how he had stolen the book from Mr. Coriander, how he had carried it off to the schoolhouse attic and begun to read. When he came to Atreyu's great quest, Atreyu motioned him to stop. He didn't seem interested in what the book said about him. What interested him in the extreme 
was the how and why of Bastian's visit to Mr. Coriander and of his flight to the attic of the schoolhouse. Bastian racked his brains, but about those things he could remember nothing more. He had forgotten everything connected with the fact that he had once been fat and weak and cowardly. His memory had been broken into bits, and the bits seemed as vague and far away as if they had concerned an entirely different person. Atreyu asked for other memories, and Bastion spoke about the days when his mother was still alive, about his father and his home, about school and the town he lived in, as much as he remembered. The three knights had fallen asleep, and Bastion was still talking. It surprised him that Atreyu should take such an interest in the most everyday happenings. Maybe it was because of the way Atreyu listened that these everyday things took on a new interest for Bastion, as though they contained a secret magic that he had never noticed before. At last, he ran out of memories. It was late in the night. The fire had died down. The three knights were snoring softly. Atreyu sat there with his inscrutable look, as though deep in thought. Bastion stretched out, wrapped himself in his silver mantle, and had almost fallen asleep when Atreyu said softly, It's because of Arin. Bastion propped his head on his hand and looked sleepily at his friend. What do you mean by that? The gem, said Atreyu, as though talking to himself, doesn't work the same with humans as with us. What makes you think that? The amulet gives you great power. It makes all your wishes come true. But at the same time, it takes something away. Your memory of your world. Bastion thought it over. He didn't feel as if anything had been taken away from him. Grogerman told me to find out what I really wanted. And the inscription on Arin says the same thing. But for that, I have to go from one wish to the next without ever skipping. Without ever skipping any. That's why I need the gem. Yes, said Atreyu. It gives you the means, but it takes away your purpose. Oh well, said Bastion undismayed. Moonchild must have known what she was doing when she gave me the amulet. You worry too much, Atreyu. I'm sure Arin isn't a trap. No, said Atreyu, I don't think so either. And after a while he added, Anyway, it's good we're looking for the way back to your world. We are, aren't we? Oh, yes, said Bastion, already half asleep. In the middle of the night, he was awakened by a strange sound. He had no idea what it was. The fire had gone out, and he was lying in total darkness. Then he felt Atreyu's hand on his shoulder and heard him whisper, What's that? I don't know, Bastion whispered back. They crept to the mouth of the cave and listened. A great many creatures seemed to be trying to fight back their sobs. There was nothing human about it, and it didn't sound like animals in pain. Starting as a whisper, it swelled to a sigh, then ebbed and rose, ebbed and rose. Never had Bastion heard anything so mournful. If at least we could see something, Atreyu whispered. Wait, I've got Elsa here. He took the glittering stone from his pocket and held it high. It gave hardly more light than a candle, but in its faint glow, the friends saw enough to make their skin crawl with horror. The whole glen was alive with hideous, foot-long worms who looked as if they had been wrapped in soiled rags. Slimy little limbs protruded from the folds in their skin. At one end, two littlest eyes peered out from under the rags, and from every eye flowed tears. Thousands of tears! The whole glen was wet with them! The moment the light from al -Sahir hit them, the creatures froze, and the friends were able to see what they had been doing. At the center of the glen stood a tower of the finest silver filigree, more beautiful and more valuable than any building Bastion had seen in Amargant. Some of the worm-like creatures had evidently been climbing about on the tower, joining its innumerable parts. But at present, they all stood motionless, staring at the light of al -Sahir. A ghoulish whisper passed over the glen. Alas! Alas! What light has fallen on our ugliness! Whose eyes have seen us! Cruel intruder! Whoever you may be, have mercy! Take that light away! Bastion stood up. I am Bastion Balthazar Bucks. Who are you? We are the Acherus. We are the unhappiest beings in all Fantasia. Bastion said nothing and looked in dismay at Atreyu. Then he said, It's you who created Amargant. 
the most beautiful city in Fantasia. Yes, the creatures cried. But take that light away and don't look at us. Have mercy. And with your weeping, you made Moru the Lake of Tears. Master, they groaned, it's true, but we'll die of shame and horror if you make us stand in this light. Why must you add to our torment? We've never done anything to you. Bastion put Alsahir back in his pocket, and again the night was as black as pitch. Thank you, cried the mournful voices. Thank you for your merciful kindness. I want to talk with you, said Bastion. I want to help you. He was almost sick with disgust, but he felt very sorry for the poor things. It was clear to him that they were the creatures he had mentioned in his story about the origin of Amrigan. But here again, he couldn't be sure whether they had always been there or whether they owed their existence to him. In the latter case, he was responsible for their misery, but either way, he was determined to help them. Oh, oh, the plaintive voice wh whimpered. No one can help us. I can, said Bastion. I have Arin. At that, they all seemed to stop weeping at once. Where have you come from? Bastion asked. A chorus of many voices whispered. We live in the lightless depths of the earth to hide our ugliness from the sun. And there we weep all day and all night. Our tears wash the indestructible silver out of the bedrock. And from it we spin the filigree you have seen. On the darkest nights we mount to the surface, and these caves are our coming out places. Up here we join together the sections we've made down below. We've come tonight because it was dark enough, dark enough for us to work without seeing one another. We work to make amends to the world for our ugliness, and that comforts us a little. But you're not to blame for your ugliness, said Bastion. Oh, there are different ways of being to blame, the Acherus replied. In what you do, in what you think, we're to blame for just living. How can I help you? Bastion asked. He felt so sorry for them that he could hardly hold back his own tears. Ah, great benefactor, the Acherus cried. You've got Arin. With Arin, you can save us. We have only one thing to ask you. Give us different bodies. Don't worry, said Bastion. I will. Here's my wish, that you shall fall asleep, that when you wake up, you shall crawl out of your skins and turn into bright-colored butterflies, that you shall be light-hearted and happy, and that beginning tomorrow, you shall no longer be the Acherus, the, everlast the everlasting weepers, but the Schlemuths, the everlasting laughers. Bastion awaited their answer, but no sound came from the darkness. They've fallen asleep, a tree whispered. The two friends went back into their cave. Hisbald, Hydorn, and Hickrian were still snoring gently. They had slept through the whole incident. Bastion lay down. He was extremely pleased with himself. Soon all Fantasia would learn of the good deed he had done. It had really been unselfish since no one could claim that he had wished for anything for himself. There'd be nothing to mar the glory of his goodness. What do you think, Atreyu, he whispered. Atreyu was silent for a while, then he replied, I only wonder what it may have cost you. Not until somewhat later, after Atreyu had fallen asleep, did it dawn on Bastion that his friend had been referring not to his self-abnegation, but to his loss of memory. But he gave the matter no further thought and fell asleep in joyful anticipation of the morrow. The next morning, the, the three knights woke him up with their cries of amazement. Would you look at that? My word, even my old mare is giggling. They were standing in the mouth of the cave, and Atreyu was with them. But Atreyu wasn't laughing. Bastion got up and went out. The whole glen was crawling and flitting and tumbling with the most comical little creatures he had ever seen. They all had bright-colored butterfly wings on their backs and were wearing the weirdest outfits. Some checkered, some striped, some ringed, some dotted. All their clothes looked either too loose or too tight, too big, or too small, and they were pieced together every which way. Nothing was right, and there were patches all over, even on the wings. No two of these creatures were alike. They had faces like clowns, splotched with every imaginable color, little round red noses, or absurdly long ones, and enormous rubbery mouths. Some wore top hats, others peaked caps. Some had only three brick-red tufts of hair, 
and some had shiny bald heads. Most were sitting or hopping about on the delicate filigree tower, or dangling from it, doing gymnastics, and in general doing their best to wreck it. Bastion ran out to them. Hey, you guys, he shouted. Cut that out. You can't do that. The creature stopped and looked down at him. One at the very top of the tower asked, What did he say? And one from, the fur and one from further down said, The whatchamacallum says we can't do this. Why does he say we can't do it? Asked a third. Because you just can't, Bastion screamed. You can't just smash everything up. The whatchamacallum says we can't smash everything up. The first butterfly clown informed the others. We can too, said another, tearing a big chunk out of the tower. Hopping about like a lunatic, the first called down to Bastion. We can too! The tower swayed and creaked alarmingly. Hey, what are you doing? Bastion shouted. He was angry and he was frightened, but at the same time he had all <laughs> at the same time he had all he could to do. <laughs> Sorry. He was angry and he was frightened, but at the same time, he had all he could do to keep from laughing. The first butterfly clown turned to his companions. The whatchamacallum wants to know what we're doing. What are we doing? asked another. We're having fun, said a third. But the tower will collapse if you don't stop, Bastion screamed. The whatchamacallum, the first clown informed the others, says the tower will collapse if we don't stop. So what? said another. And the first called down. So what? Bastion was speechless, and before he could find a suitable answer, all the butterfly clowns on the tower began to do a sort of aerial round dance. But instead of holding hands, they grabbed one another by the legs or collars, while some simply whirled head over heels through the air, and all bellowed and laughed. The act that the, wicked, that the winged creatures were putting on was so lighthearted and comical that Bastion gave up trying to hold back his laughter. But you, but you can't do that, he called them. The Acherus made it, and it's beautiful. The first butterfly clown turned back to the others. The whatchamacallum says we can't do it. We can do anything that's not forbidden, cried another, turning somersaults in the air. And who's going to forbid us? We're the schlamoofs. I am. Who's going to forbid us anything, all cried in chorus. We're the schlamoofs. I am, cried Bastion. The whatchamacallum. The first clown explained to the others, says, I. You, said the others, how can you forbid us anything? No, said the first, not I. The whatchamacallum says he. Why does the whatchamacallum say he? The others wanted to know. And who is saying he to in the first place? Who are you saying he to? The first butterfly clown called down to Bastion. I didn't say he, Bastion screamed, half fuming, half laughing. I said, I forbid you to wreck this tower. He forbids us, said the first clown to the others, to wreck this tower. Who does? inquired one who had just turned up from the far end of the glen. The whatchamacallum, the others replied. I don't know any whatchamacallum, said the newcomer. Who is he anyway? The first sang out, hey whatchamacallum, who are you anyway? I'm not a whatchamacallum, said Bastion, who by then was moderately angry. I'm Bastion Balthazar Bucks, and I turned you into Shlemuth so you wouldn't have to cry and moan the whole time. Last night you were still miserable Acherus. It wouldn't hurt to show your benefactor some respect. The Shlemuths all stopped, all stopped hopping and dancing at once and stood gaping at Bastion. A breathless silence fell. What did the whatchamacallum say? whispered a butterfly clown at the edge of the crowd but his next-door neighbor cracked him on the head so hard that his hat slid over down, <laughs> slid down over his eyes and ears, and all the others went, Psst! Would you be so kind as to repeat all that very slowly and distinctly? The first butterfly clown requested. I am your benefactor, cried Bastion. This threw the schlamoose into an incredible state of agitation. One passed the word on to the next, and in the end, the innumerable creatures, who up until then had been scattered all over the glen, gathered into a knot around Bastion, shouting in one another's ears, Did you hear that? He's our Bimifixer, whose name is Nastabin Baltabux. No, it's, it's Buxian Bananectar. Rubbish. It's Seretit Buxabem. No, it's Baldrian Hicks. Schlucks. Babbletron. Billy Scooter. Nix. Flax. Tricks, uh, beside themselves with enthusiasm, they shook hands all around, 
tipped their hats to one another, and raised great clouds of dust by slapping one another on the back or belly. We're so lucky, they cried. Three cheers for Buxafactor Zanzibar Basilben. Screaming and laughing, the whole great swarm shot upward and whirled away. The hubbub died down in the, in the distance. Bastion stood there hardly knowing what his right name was. By that time, he was so sure he had really done a good deed. So that was, <laughs> that was weird. That was harder than normal to get through. <laughs> okay, so I'll see you guys. I gotta go. I'll see you guys for the next chapter, chapter 19. Talk to you guys later.